I'd like to uh, say hello and welcome again to our uh, presentations. I want you to know that today it may be a little bit longer than our normal 10 to 15 minutes, but it's a very challenging presentation. Um, I normally do this in a dialogue format where individuals participate in a conversation. So take notes, um, notice the verses, and have a good conversation with yourself and maybe someone else. I hope this is a blessing for you and uh, maybe someday for your church. So the question we begin with, or the title, how is it going for your church? What is our purpose as a church? So I'm just going to walk you through these. Being gospel-centric is to be completing Christ's mission on this earth. The church has a global mission to make proclamation of the gospel that we are vindicated, Daniel 7.22 we are vindicated by what Christ accomplished at the cross. He is called the Savior of the world, which means he has paid in full the penalty for every human being. He has made access to the Father 24-7 for the entire human race. That's why he's called the Savior of the world. So I want you to just take a step back now and just let these verses speak and stand on their own. We begin with Jesus going throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news or the gospel of the kingdom. That is a significant point. It's what church is all about. Now, let's walk through how the dynamic works. Notice Paul's letter in, into the church of Corinth, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through uh, 1, 11. Let there be real harmony so that there won't be splits in the church, I plead with you to be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. There's so many things and so many ideas and so many individuals have great ideas, but the question is, are we united in the Word of God that brings us together harmoniously? Because the Word of God is harmonious. Psalms 133, beautiful word painting, spectacular. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edges of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon Mount Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. Notice the language here. It's, it's addressing the priesthood and then coming down upon the mountains of Zion. That's the entire kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. This whole concept of dwelling together in unity pours out a blessing on the entire kingdom of God. How do we come to unity? Prayer life. The church that prays together works together. Uh, in Acts 1 it says when they had entered the city they went up to the upper room where they were staying that is Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. In bold it says these all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. This was the precursor to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the church that prays together. There is a significant importance in our next slide in the role of leadership. Leadership is not just people who volunteer. God has leadership for a specific purpose within the church. To ignore that purpose is to limit the growth of the church. Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. So this list of leaders in the church, notice in bold, until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, which is the basis of our faith, and to the mature man, to the measure of of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Are we grown up mature men and women in Christ? Do we know Jesus well enough to know that we can come together and we don't have anything to lose? We can unite and work together as one body. 
That is the purpose of leadership. It says, continuing in verse 14, As a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Not all doctrines that come into the church are godly. It says, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. So I want you to think about this. When somebody brings some new idea into the church, there is an agenda behind it. Paul is addressing that as scheming deceitfully, as trickery of men, and those things create instability in the church. It says, growing up into Christ who is the head, verse 16, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself into love. Now listen carefully, please. Church growth comes from the united body working together with its leadership, building itself up in the agape love of Christ, centered around Christ, who is the head of the church. Growth happens in the fullness of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Ephesians 1, I'm sorry, 4, 1 to 6, there's an individual responsibility listed here. Notice this. Paul says, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you've been called. Pay attention to what you're doing. Verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That is the responsibility of every member of the church body, is to be diligent in the preservation of the unity of the Holy Spirit and the bond of peace. Verse 4, there is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called into one hope of your calling, one Lord. One faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. Today, we are struggling in Christianity because there's so many forces pulling at us to disrupt and to create divisions within the church, personal opinion, uh, individual social agendas, individual political agendas. All of those things are just tearing at the fabric of the church. And we need to let those things go and be united in the Spirit of God to be one in the Lord, in faith, in baptism, in the Father who is over all, through all, and in all. If our purposes are clear about what God wants us to do, our minds can be fixed and focused on accomplishing His will. Knowing our clear purpose as a congregation means that we know what really matters. And this saves us untold energy and resources. I want to just share James chapter 1 verses 6 and 7. But when you ask him, make sure you really expect God to tell you. For a doubtful mind will be as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. And every decision you then make will be uncertain as you turn first this way and then that. If you don't ask with faith, that faith is an affirmative yes to God, don't expect the Lord to give you a solid answer. The church doesn't have to wander and be indecisive. God will reveal himself and his purpose to you if we are about the gospel and going about the gospel business of Jesus. You see, when the purpose of God is unknown, there's a tendency for strong people to run according to their own agendas, their own purpose. But this is not so when the purpose is clear. Anything new is checked against the question, does this fulfill our purpose as a church? You see, once we are about our purpose, the waves subside considerably, and there's a calmness in the church. The word focus. Philippians 3, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect. But Paul says, I press on so that I may lay hold of that which also I laid hold by 
Christ Jesus. Now pay attention to this. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead. He is not reliving his failures. He is pressing forward and upwards ahead. He says in verse 14, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. If we're all historians and we want to live in the past of the church and whatever happened back there, good luck with that. But God is not static. God is moving his church forward and do not get left behind. Paul is saying, let's move together. Let's move ahead and see what comes next. It's too exciting. What is the one thing that we can put all of our energies on? One writer said, efficiency is doing things right. Effectiveness is doing things the right way. The question is, what are we doing? Is our purpose clear enough we can be effective and efficient in Christ? This is a tough passage. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 and 6. Check up on yourselves. Are you really Christians? Do you pass the test? Do you feel Christ's presence and power more and more within you? Or are you just pretending to be Christians when actually you aren't at all? The Christian who thinks they're a Christian but aren't are the ones who are trying to prove how good they are to themselves, to God, and to their neighbor because they are not allowing the justification that comes freely from Jesus to flow into them and do its work of sanctification in them. They're just pretending. They're going through the motions. They're acting it out like they're really good at it. But how is it with you personally? Jesus says this in Matthew 24, at that time many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. And we're not too far away from that. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. He, Jesus is saying that our single-minded purpose and focus is proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom of God, that you have been justified by faith, that he has resolved the sin problem. Revelation 1, 1 through 6. He has set you free from your sins. And that message is to go to the whole world that we can be free from the bondage that the enemy has deceived us to believe we are chained to. Revelation 14.6 is the message to go to the world. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe, tongue, and people. An eternal gospel is an everlasting gospel that never wears out that lasts for eternity and it leads you to eternity and it gets you to eternity because it is the gospel that you have been saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ and that message is to go to every human being on the planet every nation every tribe every tongue and every people that's the purpose of the church so we have two questions what is our church's business Second question, how's business? I want to close with one of Sherry's bird pictures again. This lovely bird is just sitting here. The evening sun is just catching the front of it, illuminating it. Sherry, I just want to thank you for this moment. I mean, look at the stature and the beauty of that creature. Just so peaceful. And by the way, I just enjoyed the bird feeder full of wonderful seed. I just enjoy so much the things that Sherry brings us. I hope and pray that you do too. Blessings. This was a big presentation. Watch it again. Take notes. Go back. Read those passages. Read in front of them, behind them, in the middle of them. Take notes and say, are we about God's purposes? Yes or no? Enjoy. Blessings. Take care now. Bye-bye.